My name is Jakob Gottlieb Svensson, and I come from a small company called Cortex Global. Very small, but global. <laughs> and my, my position is global lead developer, so I'm in charge of the developers in our company. And besides that, I'm consulting as uh, with a lot of automation, integration, and I've been in that company for almost 10 years now. So in the consultancy business, that's kind of, kind of ancient, you know, to be there in the same place in 10 years. Uh, so the last 10 years, or so since 2007, I've been doing almost nothing but PowerShell. And uh, teaching PowerShell and, and then moving into Orchestrator. Is anybody using Orchestrator? All right. <laughs> then SMA. Anybody using SMA? Oh, still the same. And then into Azure Automation, of course. So today it's all three. How many of you have uh, tried Azure Automation? Well, that's good. Because I wasn't planning on doing the long intro. I'm planning on doing a short intro and then show some scenarios. Let's see. Is that a good display? Here we go. <coughs> so, uh, first of all, short introduction to, to Azure Automation and OMS and to webhooks and hybrid workers. Then I'll show a scenario on... Um, actually, that's wrong. Typical me, changing the demo, but not, not changing the. So we'll, I have a demo on new uh, user, Office 365 user. Yeah. So it will generate a local user and sync it into Office 365. And then something about OMS alerts, and then a scenario using the OMS alerts. And that's why I have my telephone connected. And hopefully, this, this time my mom won't call in the middle of the session. Tried that a few times actually. Um, so if my phone rings, it's well, I couldn't put it on airplane mode since I need it for the demo. And in the end, <coughs> uh, something more about webhooks, and then a scenario on um, uh, on connecting service now to uh, yeah triggering something when there's a new incident in service now. Is anybody here using service now? Yeah, of course you. <laughs> Um, it's so the idea is to show different scenarios and usually when I do this session I don't go deep into the PowerShell but since this is PowerShell conference it might be a good idea to show some PowerShell too uh, so um, and in my session description I was talking about the graph API so anybody came just to see the graph API good because I moved that to the next session that's why I have here so people had the chance to leave is that, is that why they came but in my next session after this, after the break, I'll talk more, uh, also some scenarios, but some more advanced scenarios, for example, using the Graph API. All right. First of all, OMS is a great new management platform in the cloud uh, by Microsoft. Um, it has a, basically it started with a, a place to collect event logs, any kind of events from, from your local you know, on-premises machine. Now it's turned into uh, uh, you add these solutions and, and let's come more and more to these solutions so you can actually monitor a lot of things. So for instance, um, the security and audit here, it's one of the first uh, um, solutions. It has some uh, graphs and some, some uh, top list of security issues in your environment. And for example, in my demo, uh, you see that it, 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 OMS gets an event whenever a user is locked on a machine. And we can then use OMS to actually uh, trigger some automation. It also has um, connections to Office 365, for instance, so you can monitor and lock any kind of accessing files on SharePoint Online or uh, users logging into Azure AD or users registering a new machine in Azure AD. And all these events can actually be uh, used to trigger automation. And you can actually also send your own data in there. And unfortunately, I haven't finished my greenhouse project yet, but I'm connecting my new greenhouse at home to OMS so I can see what the temperature and soil humidity and yeah, moisture and stuff is in my greenhouse. So it's a very great tool because it has a lot of built-in solutions, but especially because you also have the the uh, options to, to send in any kind of data you need. So you just need something that can collect the data and of course uh, automation, uh, Azure Automation is a great tool for that. Um, and then 
send it in here and then you can handle the data and you can easily save uh, up to I think it's up to three years of uh, events so very powerful tool and I actually spent most of my time working on OMS at the at this uh, point in time all right then we have Azure automation which some people also call OMS automation because sometimes it scared a little people about the Azure automation uh, name they thought it was only to to actually uh, automate stuff in the cloud that's not true because we have options to actually execute things in our own environment this is a central uh, automation hybrid automation engine where we can actually uh, put our run books which is a PowerShell script on a, or a PowerShell workflow and then we can also put a lot of assets as you can see here I have 68 in this picture uh, which can be PowerShell modules uh, PowerShell credentials and there's been a lot of talk in some of the sessions I've been to about where to save credentials should I save it in a file should I write it in my script of course you write it in the script no of course you don't but th this is where you have one of the uh, advance advantages of having a system like this you have a central place with all the logs you can actually also connect the account to OMS so you get the logs in there so you have the last dry, uh, three years of executions uh, and then you have an easy way to save these credentials and of course when you execute a simple script you can execute it as a specific user and that might be enough but if you need to connect two or three systems together, you will usually have to use two or three service accounts. In that case, it's a great tool. You can also do DSC, so you can have a, it has a DSC pool server. You can put up configurations and you can connect machines. I won't uh, actually use that in, in my session here. So you see, you can actually connect it to OMS, so whenever you execute a run book, if it fails or if it is successful, you get an event here. Uh, which you can then uh, act on. You can have uh, have it send an email or trigger another runbook when a runbook fails. Um, just watch out that the next run don't also fail and then it will loop forever. <laughs> um, but that's a very powerful tool. And it's just simple PowerShell uh, workflows, the scripts, so there's nothing new there. I believe everybody here knows what PowerShell is, right? Otherwise, the might need to go to, a, to another uh, uh, room in this uh, building. Um, anyway, the assets, that is uh, run books and jobs. You have modules, you have certificates, variables, credentials, connections, which is what you use to connect to different things. If you need, for example, the H, uh, HMTP uh, GP server name, use that in, in 10 or 100 run books. You can save that in a variable here and then reuse that. Or if you, for example, need to save a simple uh, values such as when did I last check for new alerts or something like that uh, you can also use the variables for that and finally you also have schedules so you can very easily set up a schedule and make something trigger every hour or yeah the minimum is every hour but you can actually set as many as you want so you could make 60 of them and make it trigger every minute if you want to yep so first thing Another thing, it writes, it's such a great tool to have a, a, a cloud-based uh, automation engine is that we have something called webhooks, which means that the automation system is in the middle here. And if my clicker works, you then have different other clouds or other services you use, like Office 365, SharePoint. Well, that's actually part of Office 365, but anyway um service now any other uh, tool like github for instance uh, you can make them call into your run books um call in and start a run book whenever something happens the great thing about webhooks is that it doesn't require any uh, special authentication it just requires you to post something to a specific url which means that it's very easy to enable support for it in any any solution that you have there's also a REST API calls for Azure. So if you want to do a, a more advanced and maybe a more uh, robust um, a, a connection to, to automation, you can start it using the, the REST API. But the cool thing here is that it's so easy, simple to, to use. So services like GitHub, they support webhooks directly. So you can very easily set this stuff up. And of course, since you have the assets, you can then connect back 
to the other, uh, to the systems, and update them as as you want. So this was the first, uh, not the first, but this was before we had the hybrid functionality, because what we actually have uh, now and had had for also a few years now is the uh, hybrid worker. So this means that instead of executing runbooks in the cloud, you can install a hybrid uh, worker or more, one or more hybrid workers in your own environments. And then this hybrid worker can then connect to your local systems. So for example, a guy like me who is a consultant for, for a lot of companies, I could, if I wanted to install uh, a hybrid worker in different uh, smaller customers maybe, and when I updated something, I can then trigger something at all these customers. The great thing about hybrid worker is that it doesn't require an incoming connection. It is a agent running, only requiring some outgoing connections uh, to, to some specific DNS addresses, so you can actually usually convince the security guys that it's all right to, to open up for it. And of course, we can then connect, make another one in our DMZ zone, for instance. I have one in my greenhouse, as I talked about before. Uh, so we can trigger the things whenever you want. And also, we can connect to other systems using SSH, for instance, to, to, uh, to Linux. And uh, what has been announced is that there, in the future, will come support for running the hybrid worker on Linux, which means that you can then execute not PowerShell, as, as far as I know, but um, Bash or uh, Python in the beginning, um, execute that in those uh, um, systems. So this is a very simple way to get multiple data centers connected to the same automation engine. And all you do is when you start something, you then the, these uh, hybrid workers are put into groups, and then you just select a group, and one of the servers from the group will then um, execute the code. So this is what I'm going to use in my demos here is, uh, is the hybrid worker and webhooks. Um, and the hybrid worker itself runs on the OMS agent, which is also called the Microsoft Monitoring Agent, which is the same agent that uh, SCOM uses too. So it's not something that you really need to do a lot of work to actually get running. You just need to connect the machine to OMS and then run a single command, uh, uh, PowerShell command to actually register it as a hybrid worker. Yeah. As I said, there is a Azure RM REST API, also Azure Classic, of course, the service management. But the Azure RM uh, REST API has all features that you can do uh, any kind of action you would want to do against your automation account. Um, and of course, it is better than webhooks because when you trigger something using a webhook, it's simple to do, but all you get back is a job ID. I started this job. So if you want to wait, for instance, for the for the runbook to finish running, you want to check the result of the runbook, you can't do that with a webhook. You will have to do that either with the PowerShell modules or, which is of course using REST API, or to the REST API directly. Um, and of course, there is some documentation here just for the recording, uh, so you can see how you will and what features are available. Right. Now, of course, you should just ask questions if, if you have any. So, first scenario, a new Office 365 user via SharePoint. How many are fans of SharePoint? One, yes, two, great, just because. But some people say, oh, I don't like SharePoint. It's, but, you, but SharePoint is a very great tool, very easy to, to make a list in SharePoint where you can select whatever information you need. You can create, for instance, a new user uh, information and then you can have SharePoint trigger the run book. So here we have our end users, right? Um, and you have SharePoint, we have OMS, so Azure Automation, and Office 365. In our on-premises environment, we have the hybrid workers um, running. And what happens is I want an end user, or a, a user from um, HR, for instance, to go to SharePoint, open a form, fill out some stuff, and submit the form, which then creates an item in a SharePoint list. Then, using a, 
what is called Microsoft Flow. Has anybody tried Microsoft Flow? Yeah. Before we were using what's called the workflows in SharePoint, and that was uh, great. You can do a lot of things in those, but the new flow system is very simple to use. And recently they added support for executing runbooks. Therefore, when a new list item is executed or created, we then trigger the flow, which then calls in to OMS automation. And actually it does it via the REST API. Sorry about that. Uh, it's not a webhook, but it uses the REST API, which can then trigger the code uh, on our heartbeat worker, which receives the input that we have selected to send to the to the um, um, yeah to the, to the runbook. Then it can create the user on the domain controller. It can connect to the AD Connect server and sync the new user to Office 365. Uh, and then the user is actually ready to use Office 365. The final thing we do is to then go back, update SharePoint, so that we can actually um, see that what the result was. Okay, let's try that. So, it's my SharePoint site, and I created. Okay, it's very small. Give me a little bit. Better. So I created this list, and on the list you can actually select which fields you want. Uh, you can select different types of fields, so you can have a drop down, for instance. For instance, you can see if we switch to another, which is my SharePoint for the greenhouse. Um, let's see. You see, I have a list here to control if I want to turn on the water or not in the greenhouse. Uh, and that was just to show that you actually have different um, different options. You see, you can make drop downs very easily. You can make lookups so that it, it makes some, some stuff available to the user. You can do regex check. You can do a lot of things on these forms uh, to actually uh, support what what you need. But in my case, for this demo, I just have some um, a, li a list here, and I have some information about the user first name, last name, initials, and so on. You can actually here click New, uh, and you can see I can then type in different things. Uh, I could change this form if I want to to only show, maybe not show attachments or whatever I need to do. The thing is, when I trigger this run book, uh, sorry, this uh, creates a new item, I've created this thing called a flow, which is right here. Um, you can just click see your flows. And in here, you see we have a flow. And a flow is very simple to make because you, I don't know if anybody have used the uh, website called If This Then That, which is a kind of extremely simple uh, version of uh, some kind of workflow where you set a trigger which says new item created, and then you use actions to actually put in, um, you can, in, in if this, then that, you can select one trigger, one action, but here you can actually put multiple actions. You can have it split into two different things depending on the result of your execution. For instance, if I look at the enable here, you see that it tries to create a job, and if the status equals com completed, it goes down here and gets the output of the job. If not, it updates the SharePoint item with the error. It's so uh, simple to make these, and, and it's very great that we have, um, you see, you can just select the SharePoint, select the list, and then go in and select um, an automation account, a runbook, select if it has to wait for the job to complete, and then any parameter in the runbook, a PowerShell script will then pop up here in the GUI, and I can actually select from the item from which came from the uh, active uh, the acti uh, the trigger before uh, put that into the different parameters so i don't need to code anything uh, um, it has built in support for these things so you see as soon as i click on one here i can then select any kind of information and just put it in there if i wanted to um, and then since it can wait for the job to complete since it uses the the REST web service, I can then in the end have a, um, an, a, an activity that gets the result of the runbook and puts it in the log here. All right. 
In my Azure, which is also very small, I have an automation account. And in here I have my runbook, which is the um, enable Office 365 user flow. But usually when I do my work in Azure Automation, I don't do it via the website here. Well, I have done some changes, you know, in the bus with my mobile phone on the way home. Uh, but otherwise, I use a plugin, an add-on for ISE released by Microsoft, so I can actually uh, develop all my stuff here and then upload to to the uh, automation account. So if I open it here, you see this is the the runbook, and it's just a simple PowerShell script. You see here is the parameters that you saw in the GUI before. I have a few values, uh, fixed values, and then and then. Um, I have some other runbooks that I trigger to do the actual tasks that I need. So I want to update SharePoint, say now it stays in progress when it started, and then it triggers the runbook to actually create the user and sync it up to Office 365, and then it updates the SharePoint again saying user is created, but if it fails, I then update SharePoint and set it to fail and put the result as the actual error here. I'll put these runbooks, of course, uh, up on the um, on the GitHub when it's uh, when this is done. Um, and the actual runbook that then triggers the automation that, that does the actual uh, creation of the user. You see, it, the first three here says get automation variable and credential and so on. And this is how I would get my credentials to connect to AD and to connect to MS Online, Office 365. And all you do is to identify them by a text string like this. So you could actually dynamically select depending on what the inputs were. For instance, if you have different credentials for the servers in Denmark. Uh, yeah, question? Sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. So that's a good question. <laughs> um, so this is the, I think this requires a, a non-multi-factor authentication account uh, to, to be used like, like this. So usually um, we have a special account that doesn't require uh, multi-factor authentication. We need to automate these things. And then it really depends on the customer. In, in, uh, uh, in my case, as a consultant, sometimes um, we create a special account that only has a few access to a specific thing that we need to do, like update the SharePoint list. Uh, and that way we can then, uh, they, they are then okay with disabling uh, multi-factor authentication for, for that user. Yeah. I'll do that. Yeah, okay. So I can then connect to the different things. Uh, and the good thing here is that the credentials they are stored in the uh, encrypted in the database, uh, so I don't have anything in my script here. And I can actually do all the stuff here. I can create my credentials uh, or assets. I can uh, edit them. Uh, luckily, I cannot download credential assets and the passwords and everything, but I can of course type in a test user, for instance, uh, and and use those. Okay, so let's try it. But instead of triggering from SharePoint itself, um, it's right here. I'll go in and actually make a Power App. Has anybody made a Power App before? Yeah, one guy. <laughs> Power Apps is just a simple way to create a, a new GUI, you can say, for your SharePoint list. And if I go to create Power App and call it new user, uh, PS on PU, um, and I create this, I can actually access it using my cell phone uh, without actually doing anything really. I just need to uh, have it create the basic app and then save the app and then I can actually do these things via my cell phone. So for instance, what we have implemented is at a school, for instance, they, they can redeploy classrooms from their cell phone by just creating uh, a new list item saying, I want this image on that classroom and then we connect to Config Manager and of course install the stuff. 
So this is the app. You see it's automatically generated. The only little issue in my case is that for some reason it selects the password as the main title, which is probably not the best idea. Um, so what I can do here is just to select the field and then just change up here and say you shouldn't show the password, show the initials instead. And now we have the app. And of course I can do more stuff. For instance, we have the overview screen, we have a detail screen, and you see there is some stuff that I don't really want in there, like the status or the password maybe. Um, and I can actually go in and just select this one. And then you can see all the stuff is out here, so I can very simply just remove some of this stuff. Like this, gone, that's gone. And maybe I don't want the first name to be the last field, so I can just drag that up here. So I can very quickly make a, a nice GUI for this. Do the same on my, um, on, on the new screen here. Uh, oh, I want to be able to type the password, of course. Um, but I'll put the first name on top here. And the status, well, I don't want to set the status when I create a new. And of course, the result, I don't need to use that anyway. So in just a few seconds, actually, under a minute, I created an app that I can use. I save it. And then the only thing for, this, for the demo is that sometimes it takes a minute or two before it actually shows up in on the cell phone. But um, you just open the Power Apps, um, Power Apps the app. And you can see I can set whatever uh, icon I want, and you can set some information about orientation and stuff like that. But you see, I actually have it already right here, so I can go in and start it from my cell phone. Of course. I forgot to lock this on the Wi-Fi, so it's a bit slow. There we go. Usually it's not slow, I just have very bad mobile connection right now. And you can actually see it here, and I can go in and I can create a user. Let's call it PSC, for instance. Uh, first name PS, last name Cunt EU. And then a very secret password. Of course, I could have changed the, the field to not show what I was typing, but I can actually do that. And I just click Create, and it creates the SharePoint list item, just as if I were to, to actually do it from, uh, from online. Yeah? Yes, of course. And a very good point. Uh, I can either put that in my, my flow. Normally, I would do that in my actual uh, run book here. So what's happening now is it triggers this flow, uh, which you can see here, um, which triggers the run book. And in the run book, I can do stuff like that. I could make my own rules of how I want the password to be made. For instance, I talk to some, uh, some people yeah, you see now it's triggered 37 seconds ago, and I can actually see live what's happening. It got the trigger, it, cre it started the job, it's now waiting for the job to finish. So if you look in here, you see it has started the run book, and in here I can do, as I said, whatever I want. Uh, for example, yeah, a few days ago, uh, uh, a guy told me about he made a function to generate user-friendly passwords, you know, so that it's not uh, 16 uh, different weird characters, but uh, like dog 45 something, uh, which is of course not the most secure password, but they use that as an initial password just to save uh, some support calls, of course. So this triggers, and you can see here that it triggered on Denmark, which is my uh, hybrid worker group called Denmark. I selected that in my work uh, in my flow, uh, which means it runs back in the office in Denmark, connects to my um, to my. Uh, uh, yeah, to the um, to the main controller, and of course I forgot to. I tested it too much. I only have five licenses for Office 365 for this demo environment, so you see it actually failed. But that doesn't really change anything. You see, it actually created the user. Uh, it it's wait. It then synchronized the user. I I checked to see if the user is actually in uh, Office 365 or in Azure AD. 
and then um, I've tried to add the license, but it failed uh, because uh, I don't have more licenses. Uh, and then just a second, I need to open this without you getting to see my code. And if I update here, you should see that it has uh, updated the actual list point item. And again, maybe it doesn't show the error perfectly here, but, but you get the point. And you could, of course, sit and spend your Friday night on making a nicer app. Um, but you see, we have the, the result here. So it's very simple to actually create these things that you can have a nice GUI to order something. You can have it trigger the run book. And then, of course, the hard part can be to actually generate, create the, the, the actual script, depending on what you want to do, of course. No, exactly. Yeah, you can you can set the Power Apps uh, permissions. So who should it show it to? Should it be a specific group of servers? Oh, sorry, not servers. Uh, users, of course. So you would create some power some Power Apps for managing users and have a specific group in AD for that, and then put users in there. And and you might have somebody to also uh, administer deployments. So you make a some Power Apps for that, or one Power App, and then. You can then uh, put some users in there too, and if they are a member of both groups, they will see all the, the power apps that they, that they want. So of course there is many things you can do, but it's very simple to make a, a basic one. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I love SharePoint, because it's very simple to create a place where you can put all these settings or all these, um, um, yeah, have users order something new. All right. So I should continue, because the next demo actually takes a little while. Um, so what I'll do is first to trigger the actual thing. And we all know the, um, the, the thing from users, they come back from one day vacation, and then they can't remember their password. So they go, oh, maybe not the administrator, but this is employee number one, tries to put in their password. No, wrong. They try again, try again, try again. Try again, and they try again, and then, oops, pass the computer and a user account is locked. So what I want to do here is to, um, I'll just jump to the overview here. What I want to do is, first of all, we have automation, log analytics, and Twilio. Um, Twilio is a service to send and receive SMS messages, um, and then we have the users. Then we have the on-premises data center, domain controller, of course, and the hybrid worker. So the user comes in and tries to log on to the domain controller and they get a blocked account, which is of course locked to the event log of the domain controller. Within a, a minute or so, uh, even less, you will have the event up in log analytics, which is part of OMS. And I can actually set up what's called alerts in OMS that says if you get one of these events within the last five minutes, you should trigger a run book. You can either do, and it can automatically set up this webhook connection, uh, which can then connect, start the run book. I then use the username to get the phone number of the user, the cell phone number, and then I can send an SMS to the user using Twilio to their phone, uh, and they can actually answer back. I want my account unlocked, um, and it goes back from Twilio into uh, Azure Automation, like that, uh, and then I can, using the mobile cell phone number that the SMS came from, I can then figure out who sent the SMS and then unlock their account. And the, the cool thing about this is the actual runbook to uh, to figure out the SMS to receive that is the most simple runbook uh, in the world, almost. It's almost easier than running get host. Um, but the thing is, it takes, of course, a little while because. Um, because it, the, this, uh, the rules in, in log analytics say you should check every five minutes. Um, so let's take a look at the actual components. First of all, the uh, OMS. Oops. 
by OMS Workspace. And because I added the, um, the solution security and audit, it actually showed me that I had locked accounts and that's how I, in, when I first made this demo, figure out, okay, we have locked accounts right here. So if I click that, it actually generates my search. You see, now this user, and in here we have like a language to generate these searches, uh, syntax. And we can see now for 2.9.02, uh, for a few minutes ago, it picked up the event, user has been locked out. And then I have gener created this alert that then triggers the runbook. Um, and you see here the SMS arrived. You see, your account has been locked. So what happened meanwhile was that the, the alert triggered my runbook. And as I said, it, it found the, the, the users, um, I have this alert here saying, okay, you should get the Twilio connection, which is the connection to, to my Twilio account. And you can actually, you get all the data from these search results. So all the data will be sent into webhook data here. I can then go into uh, webhook data and get the actual results. And then I can use a few lines to go through the results. So for each of the locked users, I can then run this for each, get the target username field. And that is actually, you could see that in here. You see um, right here, target username, employee number one. Of course, there's a lot of different fields depending on which event you have. Then I can use get 80 user to find the user, get the uh, mobile phone number. And then I can use a, a Twilio um, module uh, which is on uh, in the gallery, which can then uh, send this SMS. Yeah. If I, yeah, that's, that's a great idea because the, what it says here is to write back unlock as, as I showed uh, before. So what happens if I send my message back, I send to Twilio and in Twilio I can set up a webhook call into a specific runbook. And this is the runbook that is uh, called handle Twilio SMS. And this is what I call a pretty simple runbook. There is a few lines where we need to, to pass the actual input from Twilio. But after those three lines up there, we can just do a simple switch and say, if it contains, if it is unlocked, run this front book. And to implement what you just said, would require two lines more here. <laughs> and then I also have another demo, which I don't do today, which is you can send the message reset and then a new password. And using uh, MFA, I then call back to the cell phone and they have to, to press a button to, to acknowledge, yes, was me. Uh, and then they get a new password. And of course, if they write something else, you just send nothing. So if I go in here, um, and actually send back, unlock, just to show that it actually works. No, because uh, by default, uh, if you don't, provide the uh, case sensitive parameter for switch in PowerShell, it will be uh, not, not case uh, sent in case, uh, yeah. yeah, case sensitive. So, so that's why I, I did it like this. Also, I trim the extra spaces because you all know that phones sometimes put an extra space after work and, uh, and that's not the user's fault. And actually, I already got your account has been unlocked. So again, I talk too much because this is too fast for me. <laughs> Uh, because the great thing about these webhooks and integrating stuff like this is that we don't poll every 30 seconds to actually see was there a new SMS or every minute or so. It is the actual SMS service calling back in, starting the runbook, which means it happens instantly. Um, and this again runs on Denmark and unlocks the account. So, and you can then see what I sent with uh, with, um, with Twilio. And if you wonder why I have a Swedish number since I'm from Denmark, 
It's because it's not really supported in Denmark yet, for some reason, uh, but it is in Germany. Once I, it was only supported in the US, and it was a bit expensive to do all these demos, sending the <laughs> SMSs there. But yeah, this this kind of show the integration between between everything. So, uh, so any questions to this uh, demo? Sometimes you should. <laughs> um, okay. So as I said, these webhooks, for example, from SharePoint, on premise, online, you can then call out using the workflow. But now you can use the flow. So service now, for instance, or any other ITSM system like ShareWell, Service Manager, whatever you would want to call into GitHub or uh, uh, a team, so we just do the team services or the on-premises TFS. Twilio, as I showed, Zapier. Zapier is kind of like a, a solution where you can also select a trigger and, and an action. It's just more advanced than uh, if this, then that, but it's not as advanced as Microsoft Flow, so it's kind of in between. And of course, if you have PowerShell, runs PowerShell, and you just want a simple way without any modules, without anything uh, like like authentication, just a single small line of PowerShell, you can trigger one of these run books. This means, for instance, in a in Scum scenario, I have another demo. Well, I could use all day with these demos, uh, but um, uh, that says if a if a computer runs out of disk space. It actually calls in and starts the run book, which then expands the disks. Because SCUM can act actually run a single command line, and if we use webhooks, we don't need modules and all that on the agents. We can easily call that. And of course, if we use Linux, BSD, or whatever, that can do a simple HTTP call, we can start a run book. And much more. <laughs> All right, let's just take the time. Did it start half past? Yeah. Yes, good. That's fine. So, new service now incident. My last scenario for, for this session. And again, the beautiful picture of end users. Service now and OMS. So, if somebody creates an incident, could be a, a user or, or anybody, uh, we then trigger what's called a business rule in ServiceNow, which says if this happens, you should trigger what's called a REST message, and we can then call into OMS using either Webhook or you could set it up to, to actually uh, to, to use the REST API. Um, in this case, I just use a Webhook for simplicity. Um, but this is actually fairly simple, but it just reminded me that I forgot to to open my service now. The cool thing about service now is that you can get a free instance, but the bad thing when you do demos is that the free instance shuts down every two hours. Whoa. Okay, they have bigger problems today. Let's just see. So you can do what you want for demos and testing and all that, but, but the actual instance will shut down and it actually takes a few minutes to start back up. Um, and of course I should have triggered this right before my startup, but I had some issues with Chrome. Chrome couldn't start and I think it's because I switched to Firefox for a few we weeks ago and then Chrome got mad. But now it actually wakes it up. Hopefully. So the thing is that to actually uh, handle stuff from from uh, from service now, it's it's very simple. Um, actually, my runbook itself is just I call them um, process service now incident, and you see I just received the webhook data. And you can easily find uh, an example of how to, of course, I said I would put my examples out, but also you can always find it on my blog. Um, I have some, I have some, uh, some stuff about 
about using. You see how to handle or miss alert result in a runbook, and that's also something about webhooks in general. Yeah, how to do the recall reaction as I talked about before. And this, is there any questions while we wait? Doesn't go this slow all the way, I can promise. No questions? So. Yeah? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a very good point. So they, it just stops running. <laughs> so one thing you should always have more than one hybrid worker in a group in a production environment, because you ha have you have you have as many as you want to in as many groups as you want to, and then you send the runbook to the group, and then one of these things, and then in that case it should be one of the other ones picking up the job, right? Oh no, <laughs> that's important. But we all know that you cannot protect yourself from evil scum administrators. But that's a very good point. Thank you. And another and very important point about uh, hybrid workers is that uh, if you have a test environment, for instance, and you want to use this uh, add-on, for on the hybrid worker itself, you should make sure that it only installs in the scope called current user, because otherwise you'll override the uh, the actual commandlets that the hybrid worker itself uses to get the assets. So the stuff here, the um, uh, these commands will be overridden by the commands of the add-on, which means that the runbooks won't work because it will actually uh, try to pick it up from your add-on and not from the real data store. But that you, sh you should just follow the uh, instructions on the add-on website and it shows how to install it correctly. But it's a, in testing environments, it's great to have this on the hybrid worker because then you know the hybrid worker has the right PowerShell modules installed and all that. Yep, so here you see, um, this could actually be any system as I say. I'll just show you that I have the, uh, made this rest um, REST call, and this is the webhook URL, and the token here is actually, did I not show it all, is <laughs> actually the password, so the actual uh, URL here is what you should keep secret, and in this case users won't be able to open this REST uh, message and see this URL, uh, so that's pretty good. Uh, and then we can inside our, have a post method that it uses, uh, which can then send some JSON to the runbook. So you'll see down here, let's see, yeah, there it was. You see, I can actually, I can actually put uh, together my request in JSON, just send the ID, for instance, of the, uh, of the actual, um, of the actual um, uh, incident. And then I have what's called the business rule, which there is a lot of uh, from the beginning, but there is also you can create your own. So for instance, also an example which we have implemented is, uh, is to when an incident closes, we want to close the alert in SCUM. So of course that could be done by using uh, one of these uh, business rules. And this business rule just say, okay, if an, uh, a new incident is inserted, as you can see here, um, and I can set some conditions saying, okay, only if it's a specific category or whatever I need. It needs to then execute an action. Uh, I could, in this case, I've done it in advanced mode, which means I can write a small script. Of course, the internet is a bit slow. Here we go. A small script that says uh, that it should trigger this REST message called post, and it should put in ID the number of the incident into the field called ID. Yes? Yeah?
Yes. That, yes, but that would be a great idea for a production scenario to, to use your ITSM system to, to generate these uh, incidents or service requests or what type you want and actually document what's happening and who did it and when did it was it. And you can actually put in, let's say, the, the job ID of the actual runbook executing. And if you then have your automation account connected to OMS, you can then save these results for up to three years. So they can go back three years, find the exact result and exact output of the runbook that happened that exact day. So that is very useful. One thing I've also like uh, for, done a lot uh, in my work is uh, accessing or giving roles to users in AD. So we remove any manual access to, to AD groups and then they can only order it through their ITSM system, uh, making sure the right people approve and then the runbook does it. And I actually had a case where a customer called me back and said, oh, your runbook doesn't work. You have you, your runbook has given a budget of five million to a, a user, and now they have done something, whatever. And I was like, I don't believe that. Let me come out and see that if it actually were that. So I looked into it, and I found the exact day, and I found, okay, this vice president has at 10.45 approved this from his cell phone, and therefore there's not anything wrong here. It's just a, a vice president who didn't really read his, his uh, approval. And then we could actually, and they were like, okay, we'll just send it to him and say, sorry, this was actually not a technical problem. It was uh, a yeah, problem from his side. But that really showed, but unfortunately, they hadn't removed the actual manual access to the group. So when we investigated, we found out that they had given over a thousand accesses outside around the system. And then all the revision stuff was just not working, so we made scripts to remove all that access, of course. But this is very powerful because you want revision always. Yep, so I create a new incident. I select a caller here. Like that. And here it's gone. You test one, give in whatever I need. Submit it, and you'll see if I jump back to my, let me just see if it saved it. There we go. Um, I jump back to my jobs here. And you see it's already, it's already handled this. It's already starting to run. So it triggers instantly. And you can then see in the output that it received the ID and the number of the incident. So I could take any field from the incident or whatever was created. Could be a new computer is created in the, or a new, um, uh, we use this sometimes to control as patch windows on computers. So when you, when you give a computer a patch window, we then contact SCCM and put it in the right uh, uh, maintenance windows. Yeah, but the great thing is it triggers really fast and it, um, and you don't have any unnecessary polling. All right, so summary before we end is use webhooks or the REST API, of course, event-based uh, triggering instead of polling, if possible. Um, you'll see in my, if you come to my next session after the break, I'll show how to trigger a runbook when you receive an email in Office 365. And in that case, you could have a case where you check every five minutes and there's one email a month. And that's like 10,000 unnecessary pollings before you actually find an email. So it's much better to have Office 365 call back whenever the email arrives. It makes also things more simple um, in reality. And then the last summary is that hybrid workers rock because it's so simple to set up and it doesn't require any outgoing connections, uh, no, sorry, incoming connections, only outgoing connections, and it's very easy to use. Yep, Any questions? No more questions? All right. And of course, there's some information about me uh, when you download the slides. Um, otherwise, I'll just say thank you, and I hope I see you back after the break.